knocked out by football in the yep. 70s. But in the 70s, now we see an emergence of the ABA, the American Basketball Association. Why would you go forward with, an, uh, with, a, with a league, a, ch a challenger league, when your sport's not one or two? <laughs> well, the ABA started out as a football league, at least on paper. Um, they all of a sudden decided, let's get into this basketball business, because people began to look at TV. Mm -hmm. And the ABA chased TV. That's what they wanted, a network contract. All the owners would have been real happy if they got it. They never did get it, even though they hired Jack Dolph, who ran CBS Sports. You know, the end story for the ABA is the Silners of New Jersey lived on happily ever after because of TV. The spirits of St. Louis, they ended up getting a settlement, four-sevenths of the TV money in perpetuity. And it was a deal concocted by the lawyers. And Dave DeBusher in the book talks about, don't blame me, it wasn't me. <laughs> I didn't come up with that. But the lawyers figured out some sort of formula. And the Silners, by not operating the St. Louis franchise, have made millions upon millions upon millions of dollars. And it's in perpetuity. They never got a team in St. Louis. But the Silners made out real well, and Bob Costas made out real well, because Bob was the announcer mm -hmm. of the Spirits of St. Louis that year. But only the, the Nets, Pacers? And Nets, Pacers, Nuggets, and Spurs made it into the NBA. And the Nets, by going into the NBA, nearly toppled the Islanders. Uh, Roy Bowe, who is the Nets, I don't know how much time we have. We, we got 12 minutes We here. got 12 we minutes, okay. Fine. Yeah. The WHA, World Hockey Association, forms in 1971. Same guys who put together the ABA and yeah. would put together the World Football League. Um, there's the empty arena that's being built in Nassau County. Roy Bowe is the owner of the New York Nets in the ABA. And the NHL needs a favor. They need Roy Bowe or somebody to get an NHL team in that building. Bo bid for the team, paid $6 million for the Islanders in 72, paid the Rangers some money uh, over 20 years as far as indemnity. And uh, he did the Garden a tremendous favor, a big favor, putting his hockey team in there and keeping the competitive, the WHA, out of that league. And WHA, ABA were the same, mm -hmm. NHL, NBA are the same. Um, and that's for sports history and sports economics and sports business. Um, when the merger comes along in 1976, Roy Bowe does not get any favors. Um, the Knicks, and he bailed out Madison Square Garden. Remember, they didn't want a competitor from another league. He bails out Madison Square Garden in 1972 or 71. In 76, uh, the owners, Gulf and Western of Madison Square Garden, say to Bo, you're invading our territory with your basketball team. We want $3 million, or $4.8 million, actually. He sells off Julius Irving for $3 million to the 76ers. The Knicks would have gladly taken Julius Irving, but he wasn't going to send him to the Knicks. Um, Bo was in such bad financial shape that it almost toppled the Islanders. Um, Bo is an interesting guy because he tried to make people whole. When he signed Julius Irving, who had signed with the Atlanta Hawks but was forced back to the Nets because of court case, he made an interesting trade. He traded the rights to Pat Ribble, who was a hockey player, to the Atlanta Flames in exchange for Julius Irving. Ribble was a serviceable player for the Atlanta and Calgary Flames. So he tried to do his best. Uh, the Islanders nearly folded. Uh, they nearly sold Dennis Potvin to the Boston Bruins for millions of dollars. Uh, John Pickett came in. He straightened out the Islanders. Uh, the Nets were sold to New Jersey business men who played in Piscataway, then the Meadowlands. Now they're in Brooklyn, and the Islanders are going to Brooklyn. Um, end of story. Right now, the Islanders and Nets are going to be back together, even though Charles Wong owns the Islanders. He's given all the marketing to the Brooklyn Nets people. But... Uh, there's some strange stories. Um, in 1972, my, my friend, who I was on the phone with last night, Bob Block, um, that would be April 29th because we're taping this on April 30th. Yeah. We're talking about the, uh, the book, and he's in the book, and he was just saying, I'm so happy I'm in the book. And uh, he had bought the Chicago Bulls, and he was thinking of moving the Bulls somewhere in Chicago, maybe Rosemont Horizon, 
uh, where the building is now. And he was going to have a 5,000 seat stadium, all high rollers in there, and put the games on pay TV. And uh, Arthur Works, the owner of the Chicago Blackhawks, didn't want the competition. He, the NHL owner, called the NBA owner to scuttle the sale to Bob Block and his associates. Make a long story short, that played out in court for about 15 years, and eventually Bob Block's group, and he dropped out of it because Bob Block was in the pay TV business, and he was trying to get Jack King Cook's business with the Los Angeles Lakers and Kings. He dropped out of the lawsuit, but 15 years later, it was finally solved, and the, the remaining people in, in Block's group won an antitrust suit and millions of dollars from Arthur Wirtz. So there was torturous interference from the NHL uh, on the NBA, and um, so, but hockey started basketball. So, I mean, so all these people tell me all the time, oh, there's no correlation between the NBA and the NHL. I said, why don't you sit down here for the next 15 minutes and I am going to educate you. Yeah. But, but it seems that that business model is where we have progressed that yeah. the average Joe can't yeah. get into the house. Bob, uh, yeah, it was yeah. Bob's idea in, in 1972, and uh, Bob, it's it's progressed in that way. Not certainly pay TV the way Bob envisioned it, mm -hmm. but it's the cable TV, cable TV act in 1984, where yeah, the prices in the building are for the high rollers. And if you're a fan, you get to sit in front of the TV and pay your money, whether it's 12, 14 bucks a month in terms of all the sports things that you get. But then again, 100% of the cable audience is getting uh, the same the same thing. And some teams, some organizations, Rangers, Knicks, uh, probably Comcast, are just printing money now because of Ronald Reagan's 1984 signature. You've mentioned a number of the oral interviews that you did yeah. with regards to the book. I'm just curious, can you think of any of the players that you chatted with? And I'm thinking of players who may have been dual sports stars because we're talking of a time period where yeah, guys Dick, actually had to have a job in addition to Yeah, Dick Grote was one of them. Uh, Dave DeBusher was one of them. Dick Grote was great. He was talking about... Uh, and you're a baseball guy. Yeah, that's right. About Paul, Paul Weiner and all these guys. Gene, Con uh, Gene Conley uh, was talking about uh, being with the Milwaukee Braves and the Boston Red Sox and the Boston Celtics. Um, I did those interviews. The interviews that really stick out were from Ozzie Sheckman. And these interviews were done about 15, 17 years ago. Ozzie Sheckman scored the first two points in the NBA. Uh, Jerry Fleischman, who was on the Warriors and Knicks, Sonny Hertzberg. Uh, Butch Van Bredekoff, um, it's the uh, Tom Heinsohn, uh, these guys, Dolph Shays, no clue. I mean, they just went out and they played. They're going to play two, three years, say, I play pro basketball, and then get on with the rest of their lives. Most of them did. Bobby Wanzer is in the book. Uh, and he was talking about he wasn't going to be a lifer. He stayed there until he was 40, 40 years old. Dick McGuire ended up being a lifer. Nobody was a lifer. This was, you know, if you lost, as and then Bredikoff talks in the book, if your team lost four in a row, somebody was going to get cut, you get on with the rest of your life. Uh, then Bredikoff, of course, became a lifer, college basketball and some pros. But uh, nobody ever really expected this to take off. Hey, the NBA in the 1950s, if you wanted to find them in the summer, you found them in the Catskills at mm -hmm. Cutchers. That's yeah. where you found them. That's where they were. That was their summer headquarters. Uh, now, we know in the 1950s, the point-shaving scandals yes. with Cooney, the college basketball. When does Vegas begin to turn its eyes towards professional basketball? I think they always did. Uh, I think, you know, the games were there for a point. I just, you know, Bob Pettit in the book talks about the playing in New York, and he thought it's, he had strange crowd reactions. The Hawks would go in, they'd be winning by nine, the point spread would be ten, somebody would shoot, the Hawks would go up by 11, and you'd hear a big roar from the crowd. Or if somebody misses a basket, Nick score, there was booing and stuff. So obviously there was betting going on 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 Knicks games anyway. And and Pettit said that was the strangest thing. But you know the NBA tried to police itself. They kept Connie Hawkins out uh, and uh, kept Doug Moe out and Roger Brown. Roger Brown is going into the Basketball Hall of Fame this year as a member of the ABA. Officially, he's never been reinstated by the NBA. Connie Hawkins was. Doug Moe obviously was. 
And I got a good Connie Hawkins story. You'll okay. appreciate this as a basketball guy, as a baseball guy. Uh, Connie was playing with the Pittsburgh Wrens of the American Basketball League. He left Iowa, and, and Eddie uh, Abe Saperstein took care of him, and he went into the American Basketball League. They didn't care about points shaving and all that other stuff, and Connie was never involved in it. So um, they're playing Cleveland. George owns George Steinbrenn owns the Cleveland Pipers. This is 1961, and Connie puts up a ridiculous amount. George, after the game, says, I'm trading for you. Trading for me? He says, yeah, I'm trading for you. He says, I'm trading my whole team for you. And Connie said, with all due respect, Mr. Steinbrenner, the basketball's played by five guys who are going to be my teammates. No, I don't care. I'm still trading for you. George went, offered to trade his entire roster to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh thought about it and then said no. But that was George Steinbrenner's introduction to sports through basketball. And um, so he fired John McClendon. McClendon was in first place. Uh, mm -hmm. Bill Sharman, who had played baseball too, was a bigger name. George hired him. McClendon's next job was in Malaysia coaching basketball because he wanted to get as far away from George as possible. Uh, Dick Barnett's interviewed in the book, mm -hmm. and Dick talks about when he saw George was part of the Yankees, he said, there's no such thing as a limited partner <laughs> with George Steinbrenner. But George, everything that you saw with the Yankees actually happened with the Cleveland Pipers in 1961. The ABA, I just am amazed as to uh, some of the teams not being able to get into the NBA. I mean, the Floridians of, of Miami. I mean, and today the heat is Yeah, clearly. well, you know, Floridians almost ended up in Cincinnati in 72. They folded. The ABA had no money. That was the problem. Uh, they never did have money. Roy Bowe didn't have any money. Denver had some money. The Dallas franchise was loaned to San Antonio. They never gave back the franchise. <laughs> it was just, here, you want it, take it. And, and they did well. Uh, the Spurs came in. Uh, the Nuggets, Denver Nuggets came in. They had the first uh, ABA All-Star game that featured entertainment and the slam dunk. Uh, mm -hmm. Everything good about the ABA, the NBA co-opted. They just didn't take Virginia. They didn't take Kentucky, and they didn't take St. Louis. St. Louis turned out real well. They did pay off John Y. Brown, and then John Y. Brown, who is the Colonel, Kentucky Colonel's owner, ended up with Buffalo. He flipped franchises with Boston. Boston then flipped franchises with the San Diego Clippers and... Uh, Basketball was nomadic until the end of the Larry, uh, Larry O'Brien era and the beginning of the David Stern era. Even in Stern's first years, franchise was were moving. Um, Virginia couldn't hold out anymore, mm -hmm. and they should have held out because they would have gotten a settlement. They just folded up. Kentucky got a settlement, and and St. Louis got the best settlement ever, ever, ever in all of North American professional sports. Wow. Well, we're going to be have to uh, moving because we've got about 30 seconds here. But folks who want to know more are going to be able to go to Smash Mouth. Uh, uh, Smash, Smash Words. Ma yes, yeah, Smash Words. Wor you know what? This is what you do. You look up my name, Evan E V A N Wiener W E I N E R. Just do a search on the engine. Look up Evan Wiener books, and you'll find I have three books floating around out there right now: uh, a football book, the basketball book, and 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 a, uh, another book. Just go look it up. It's on Smashwords. It's on Apple. It's on Kobo. It's on Nook. It's on Diesel. It's available for all kind of all kind of phones and things mm -hmm. like that. So, it's the new way of life. Yeah. New publishing. Well, Evan, it's a pleasure for you to come in here. I really thank you for taking us beyond the game yeah. today and giving us an assessment from 47 up until 83. And this is John Vorparian saying thank you for sharing this time with us.